when you start jujitsu, you might have um, certain expectations of what it's going to be like or what you should know or expect to um, be able to do. And there's a couple really important things to think about as far as when you first begin jujitsu. One thing that isn't really intuitive per se is just doing moves that you might think are okay but are not okay. So we would call these dick moves or maybe you're just like being mean is one of those things people say. Like sometimes with your friends you can joke and do some of these things but honestly if you're training with someone that you're not really familiar with you can't even do it as a joke. It's just not cool. And so we're going to talk about some of the primary ones that you may think are is okay. So let's go back to our favorite position, the closed guard, to start. This is a, we're just going to use this position because it's one of the first positions you're going to see when you make it onto a mat. You're going to be like, oh, yep, closed guard. I'd watch that video, so I know what, what's going on here. The first thing from closed guard, there's a ton of things you can do here that are dick moves, but they kind of work too, so they're tempting. So if I'm in someone's closed guard like this, the most common one I see is white belts will pick this up seeing someone else do it or someone does it to them and they're like, oh yeah, that move is awesome. And it's driving your elbows into their thighs like this. So like his legs are wrapped around, you wanna get out of them like this. And there are ways to escape this obviously, but it may like some light bulb might go off in your head like, oh, I could just like get his legs like this and that'll get me out of here. So you'll find white belts, yeah, get me. yeah, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> and it actually kind of works a lot of the time. But it's just really painful. If someone does it to you, you're not going to like it. And also, it doesn't really work. Like, if he just grabs my arms or brings my posture forward, it's not going to work. And I'm going to be like, <laughs> and you're going to kind of waste your energy. So that's a dick move. Don't drive your elbows into their thighs like this. That's no good. Another thing that might happen from this situation, he's trying to, like, grab my collar or something. And I, like, grab his fingers to, like, kind of get control. Grabbing someone's fingers is always really nice because... It like they're, they're kind of ropey, so it like they squish into your hand. It's very nice control, but don't do this, okay? Grabbing someone's fingers, he can't really break the grip, and you might hurt their fingers. You could, if someone does that to you, you're not going to like it, especially if you have a sore finger. Like, ah, I, my, my grips are kind of sore from someone like pulling the gi out of my hands, and my finger's kind of fucked up. People's fingers are just injured a lot in jiu-jitsu, or at least a little painful. So make sure to not grab people's fingers. Those are things that are... Kind of go without saying, but also you kind of got to say them because people are going to do it anyways. No pressure points, no jabbing your fingers into people's bodies. Like, do not stab them with your fingers. Do not try and grab their rib cage or like get inside their armpits or any sort of sensitive area of their neck. Like, I've seen people like grab with their fingers like into the clavicle. Like, just free this is not, this does not feel good. It's very invasive and you're not going to make any friends jabbing your fingers into people's bodies in any way. So stick to the jiu-jitsu moves that you are taught. And Andres said this earlier, it's kind of like you have to try without trying too hard. You like, you want to win, but you're not willing to cheat to win, you know? So these moves I'd consider cheating. We want to use real jiu-jitsu, which we, that's what you're here to learn. So any sort of like schoolyard tactic, headlock, squeezing someone's head really tightly, you know, uh, pressure points, bending fingers, obviously the, the ones that should go without saying no biting, no pulling hair. Slamming as well. No eye gouging, no slamming. That's a really good one. You are not trying to hurt your opponents here. If I'm frustrated and I like pick Andres up and slam him down, that could legitimately kill him. Like it could knock him out. It could hurt his neck really badly. And even if you're big and strong, that is not a viable way to deal with a situation because what if you go against someone who's bigger and stronger than you and then they do that to you. That's the reality. It's like no one is ever top dog. If you slam someone, that's going to come around eventually and you're going to get slammed one day and you're going to understand what you put that person through and it's going to be hor horrifying. So don't ever slam. Also, just to follow up on slamming too, if you are picking someone up, because a lot of times there's scenarios in which you're lifting someone off the ground, if you don't have the confidence that you're going to be able to maintain them for any extended period of time, you don't feel you have the ability, you shouldn't even try it. Really early on, you shouldn't do it anyway, but if you're doing something that you feel you don't have the strength to do, you're gonna unintentionally slam them. And even though it wasn't your intentions, you're just gonna look bad doing that. So it's really important to avoid that. Yeah, keep it on the ground. Don't be trying to pick people up, even with takedowns. Sometimes you may learn a takedown where it involves kind of lifting the person, or maybe it's like involves maybe some judo, so it's more of like a foot sweep or something that kind of like throws them down to the ground. Those can be done with a lot of force and impact, and it's your job to protect each other. So when you're practicing this with your training partners, you're trying to do it gently and do it right and softly. It's always about the form and the technique first. You don't worry about speed and power. That you, 
You only ever do that like once you're at purple belt, black belt, brown belt, um, levels where people know how to go hard and like this, the pace has reached a point where both people are going to that pace and both people know how to fall and the, the game is in full swing and you've really learned how to engage with each other. So there's a, that, that's basically all of them. Can you think of any other ones? Well, those are physical dick moves. Then there's dick moves that aren't quite physical. There's just little things that you want to try to avoid doing. And one that's really important is let's say you've been training for a very short period of time and maybe a week, a couple of weeks, and the new guy comes in and you're working with him. Don't try to explain every single technique to him. Let the instructor do it. Remember, your instructor, he's pay, you, you guys are paying for his services, so don't take on this role as assistant instructor and show them everything. And, and sometimes you want to give them feedback, like, oh, this didn't work, let's call the instructor over, or oh, the choke isn't quite there. But when you're trying to just show them every piece of a technique that you don't really know as well as you think you do, it's just going to cause mass confusion. Just remember that the person who's running the class, that's their job. And if they are questioning you about the technique, like, what do I do if this happens? Say, oh, let's just get the instructor over and he can assist us. It's just gonna make it better for everybody involved. And I understand a lot of times it's with good intentions. You just wanna help the person out. But if you feel, if it's something very basic that you completely understand, give a little bit of feedback. But when, don't start professing all of your knowledge to this person who's new and you're new too. And it's something a lot of people do. Sometimes it's just because they wanna just assert a level of um, education on the person, but sometimes it's just because they're passionate about jujitsu and they want to share it, and it's not always with bad intentions, but always, when in doubt, just get this instructor to come over. And then another thing, um, and this is just going to save a lot of hassle for your instructor, if you're demonstrating a, um, let's say uh, Keenan puts me in an arm bar, the technique is an arm bar, okay? Now let's say I'm kind of flexible, and he has the arm bar, and he's just learning the arm bar, and we're just practicing the technique, and he goes for it, and I'm really flexible, and I'm just trying to wait out to the last second and I'm just trying to basically demonstrate, oh, look how flexible I am. Just tap, okay? I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Coach, I'm doing it wrong. Yeah, and this is what happens too. And it's like, this is correct. The arm is fully extended, but people have a tendency to do this if they're flexible. Not everybody, but they just wanna wait and they just wanna just, just basically just show that they're very flexible. It's like, truthfully, nobody cares that you're flexible. When the arm is, when the technique is executed properly, just tap. Don't be stubborn with techniques. Just when it's correct. It's one thing if it's just wrong. If it's wrong and you're not tapping, that's fine. Then the instructor is going to come over and assist. But don't, and don't wait off. If someone's choking you, don't wait till you're about to lose your last brain cell to tap. Just tap the second you feel it. The second your arm's extended when you're demonstrating technique, just tap. The second the choke is initiated and it's, you feel the discomfort of oxygen leaving your brain, just tap. Don't, it just is going to make it very confusing for the person you're working with. Yeah, that's the, what the sparring is for. To make sure your moves work properly is when you get to try them in sparring, where it's like the tone is set, like I, you're gonna try and escape this as I do it to you. But when you're just first learning, it has to be this, like you allow them to do the moves because this is a learning process. Maybe it's the first time you've ever done a move like this. You don't wanna resist, you don't wanna make it like, oh, you're not quite there yet. Give it a little bit more. Like, no, just let them practice the move. There will be times in the future where a little bit more like active resistance makes sense to learn a certain move, but in the beginning, it's like exactly how Andres put it. Just allow them to do the move and then switch and then it's your turn. And if you really wanna try and hold out, do it in a sparring situation where you can test your limits a little bit more. But even still, it's it's never worth like seeing how long you can last in the submission or the, the choke or something like that. Um, you should tap earlier. You'll, you'll increase the longevity of your physical activity in your life if you protect yourself in those ways. Yeah, and just know guys, it's just when you're first learning a technique for the first time, it's not the time for resistance. And it's also not really the time to explore either. I see a lot of people do this too, where they're like, oh, let's see if I defend this way or this. Just do the technique that's instructed and you'll have time to innovate. That time is gonna come, but you're, you're gonna spread yourself thin. Just stick with the technique that's being taught and practice that with the person with no resistance. Resistance is gonna come during rolling, as Keenan said, so it's important to do that. Another dick move that uh, um, is very, very common at the beginner levels is like, if it's your first day at class, but maybe you had a little bit of experience before and you're training with another person who's maybe a little bit new, but they've been there longer than you, like a month or two, you may be rolling with them and they'll, they'll pull one of these. So like, um, I, you're, the, you're the new guy, I've been here for a little while and let, let's roll and you arm bar me or something. So it's like, okay, we're rolling. I'm like, you pass my guard and he gets me in the arm bar. And we were just doing sparring. I'm like, oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, you got it. Okay, turn the thumb up now, uh-huh, just like, and now raise your hips. Okay, tap. Nice, yeah, good work, bro. You got that one, yeah. 
And it's a kind of this like condescending, patronizing tone where it's like, you didn't actually get me, I, I walked you through it. That one's very common. Oh, yeah. I, we don't see that one in our gym too much, but it, I definitely saw that a lot coming up as when I was, especially when I was younger. As both of us as juveniles, adults would always do that. Nonstop, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that happens for women a lot yeah, of the time. Absolutely. It's especially patronizing, trying to like doing that to women is really bad, which also just a dick move brings us to just rolling with girls too. So one, don't try and coach people through a move. Let them do it. Le always leave the coaching to the head instructor. Like you are not a coach, you're there to learn also. And I know it can feel like you're helping, but just that you have to understand that there's, there's this kind of like Dunning-Kruger effect where you just begin and you think you know a lot, but really you don't know anything yet. And, and if you try and help people, you'll probably do more harm than good most of the time just because there'll be a lot of pieces that you missed that you've then delivered to them as if it's the full package. And now they have a, a, you know Swiss cheese for a technique and there's a lot of holes in it in the game. So always leave it to the instructor. They'll always be able to point out little details that you probably didn't see or notice. Um, and yeah, so that brings us to rolling with girls, which is in jiu-jitsu, you're going to experience rolling with girls. Obviously, you must be very, very respectful of them. Like you, You're not there to try and beat a girl. You're always going to be able to overpower them. However, what ends up happening is you'll have a girl who's talented or maybe she's, she's been training a while, she has more experience. A woman in jiu-jitsu can easily beat a man with no experience or little experience. And there's a lot of women, like we have some women here that regularly beat guys every single day because their technique is better. And that's a reality of jiu-jitsu that as a man, you have to, and of course there's women watching this as well, but from the men's perspective, when you're rolling with a woman, you have to do jiu-jitsu with them. You're not in a strength contest with them. The rule is you always match their strength and then try and do jiu-jitsu against them. So if at any point you're using more strength or you're using your weight, that is the wrong way to approach this and you're, you're not gonna make any friends and you're not gonna get partnered up with certain people. Even smaller men, you have to treat them the same way because it's not about the gender, it's just about the size difference that's important. A smaller man or even a teenage boy or something like that, you're never gonna like try and beat them seriously. I mean, there's some teenagers that'll kick your ass, but. Um, that the idea is if you're physically larger, more imposing, heavier, you always have to bring yourself down to a level physically where you're matching them or even less. And then you're allowing them to do jujitsu against you as if you, you, you guys have equal strength and weight. And that, that creates just a really nice kind of flow where everyone gets to practice. No one's just going to get smushed and no one's gonna get injured. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, just the thing on that too is, we're not telling you when you go against a, uh, a girl as a guy, or if you're going with someone significantly smaller than you, to not do anything. We're not saying let them beat you up, but you have to dial it back. And when you do that, it's going to be good. It's going to be beneficial for both of you. One, they're going to have a role where they can actually do stuff. And also, you have this role where so many of your roles in the room are going to be very competitive, where there's a lot of deadlock. And you're going to not have that in that role. There's not really moments where you're really in danger. So you get to open up and experiment a little bit and just play the game, which is really important. Especially as a white belt, it's really good to program yourself early to not tense up and go super aggro because there is a stigma that white belts are very spazzy. And it's true. A lot of times white belts are scarier to roll with than black belts just because you can't anticipate their movements because a lot of times they don't know what the hell they're going to do. They're just all over the place. And when you have those roles, it takes that away. You can kind of think more and it teaches you to breathe as you go and just kind of experiment and play around, but it shouldn't be competitive. There are people that you absolutely, when you roll with, you can be competitive with people at your level, your size, but you got to dial it back. And it, not just the, for the sake of um, not hurting them, but it's also, you remember, you're a team, you want to work together. And those people are getting beat on every day a lot of times because they're rolling with stubborn white belts who just are really just aggressively holding them in side control. And when you're doing that, you're not even learning. Like holding side control, it's not, or holding the mount on someone who's much smaller, you're not really progressing. This is, it's a short-term success where you feel you won in the role, but long-term you're not learning anything. You're gonna learn a lot more by just opening up your game and just moving around with them and not focusing on a submission necessarily. Yeah, and there's always a bigger fish. Like you may be, if, if you ever feel like you're beating people and you feel like good about that, don't let it get to your head because you're still a white belt. And this is the part of like being a white belt that kind of sucks. It's like you want to experience the growth and you're going to feel it every day you're getting better. And that is a real thing. You are getting better. 
but it can, it can get out of hand sometimes when you feel like you're like better than the other white belts because you like just tried harder and maybe they're just following Andres's instructions a little bit better as far as like taking things slow and really trying to learn and improve rather than trying to win. So you can have one white belt that's there to win and kind of is ignoring the coach and he goes around trying so hard against everyone and everyone else is kind of like, wait, I thought we were supposed to like try and improve before we try and win. I can try and win too. And then they both start trying to win and that's when the spastic stuff happens. So it's like, it only takes one bad apple to kind of spoil the bunch. Whereas like we're, we're rolling and maybe the drill is like, okay, we're only passing guard now. And there's this like, to win, you have to pass my guard and get to side control and he won, right? Okay, so it's like, okay, next round, wait a second. He tried really hard, I'm gonna try really hard. And then the kicking starts happening. And it's like, kind of like gets crazy and wild to just try and win. And, that kind of spastic stuff is is the stigma associated with white belts. So if you don't want to be recognized as that white belt that's like a spaz, you have to be relaxed. And all that means is just like to be relaxed and not spastic, it means only do the moves that you've been taught. You know, do the real move. If you're playing guard and you try and you try a guard and it fails, like don't freak out. It's just you lost because the move wasn't done quite right. And that's okay, but you just got to try it again. It's it's when you're like, oh, that move didn't work. I'm just going to try. And I just am doing anything. That's the craziness. That's the unpredictability. And like Andre said, it can be scary with, to roll with white belts. Like when white belts are rolling with white belts, it's even doubly more important for both people to be relaxed and calm and be like, okay, we're here. We're going to try these moves. We're not necessarily trying to beat each other in this moment. Like there's a little bit of that. Like there's a goal to accomplish, but we're not trying to win. We're both trying to achieve the goal. So that's an important frame of mind to enter into as well. Anything else on that? Um, just remember too, when you're rolling with upper belts, um, you're going to, you might have the mindset, oh, this guy's so much better than me. I have to try. But if you don't have any techniques and you're trying without techniques, you're probably spazzing out. I know one thing that I, when I was a white belt years ago, a blue belt said this to me. Um, and at the time it made no sense, but it just, um, it makes so much sense. Now he just said, you're trying way too hard. And to me, I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. I need to try. But if you don't have techniques and you're just all over the place, it's, first of all, the upper belt's not going to want to roll with you anymore. And if they're not a thrasher, it's like a good upper belt who wants to work technique with you, dial it back. Just kind of move with them. See what they give you. Yeah, exactly. Like when I roll with my students, with my white belt students, I'll just, I'll give them, I'll take techniques, but I'll also give them techniques. It's a role that's really one of the best roles they can have in that room. Because with other white belts, a lot of times it's a lot of, um, just that stagnant battle and that chaos. But with me, I'm kind of presenting them opportunities and they take them, I take them away and I and I start taking stuff here and there. But when I feel a, a white belt spaz out and go nuts, I don't even beat them up. I just put them in adult timeout. I just hold them for five minutes and I won't let them do anything for the whole round. So, I mean, that's a, if you go crazy, that's a great way to make upper belts not want to roll with you. And if they do roll with you, they might not be as nice as me. They might just put Fight like, you hard exactly. Back. And then you might think like, why do they do that? I was just trying to win. But if you're real, you have to learn the techniques before you truly try. Just try to dial it back and matching intensity is very important too. Try to match the intensity of who you're rolling with. If they're going crazy with you and it's like someone at your level, maybe you can go kind of hard. But if, if it's a, a girl or a smaller person, as we said earlier, that can't bring that intensity, give them exactly what they're giving you. Yeah, and also the... Like you may be nursing some sort of injury or maybe you got a bad knee or bad back or like a shoulder or something like that. It's important to communicate that with your partners, especially if they're beginners in white belts, because they're not going to know how to even protect your, your bad shoulder, your bad knee, even if you tell them. So if you're kind of nursing an injury that you want to be careful of, you have to say, hey, you know, I, my shoulder's kind of bad right now. Try not to like go for anything on this arm. Like don't go for Kimura on this. And like putting constraints on the match is going to slow it down significantly, but it's also something that's necessary. Necessary. So uh, I think that's the right mindset. And there are, are a lot of things like this where it's like, oh, well, there's all these rules. Like, I, what, how, what if I just want to, like, come train? Like, there's, there'll always be a space for people that just want to come fight, too, you know? You'll see, like, who that's allowed with and who that's not allowed with. And, like, there's, a, there's sort of, like, an intro round where, like, maybe the first time you roll with someone, you both just kind of flow and then kind of feel each other out. And there's this sort of learning process where you're getting accustomed with your training partners. And you're like, okay, I know that guy, me and him kind of battle. Me and him, we go a little bit easier and try and work her technique. Or me and her, she likes to just try and work her guard retention or some specific thing that me and her work on. But then when I roll with him, it's like, that's my gym rival. And we fight to the death every single time. And that's okay because it's, like, 
every different scenario is consensual based on communication and like actively asking your partner what they need out of the round. And you, you kind of have to do that in every single round. It's by no means the same thing for each person. It's kind of, you got to dial it specifically for each one. And then as far as rolling with the upper belts, as a white belt, rolling with an upper belt can be intimidating. It can be intimidating to even ask the upper belt. And this all still falls in line with dick moves, but this is more towards just like etiquette at this point where if you ask a higher belt to roll and they say yes, which I think you sh is encouraged, I think you should ask higher belts. There, There is a, a sort of weird stigma like, There's oh, you're a gym, not supposed it, to. It depends on the culture of the gym too because different gyms have different cultures, so you kind of have to observe the culture of your gym. And as dumb as I think it is that you can't ask upper belts, a lot of gyms have that policy, so you kind of have to gauge, especially as a white belt, you're new, and you're, it's okay if you make some mistakes at first, but you've got to read the culture of the gym that you're in. Yeah, the worst, the worst response you can get is no, as long as you don't let that hurt your feelings that's fine upper belts have been asked to roll by every belt uh, forever and ever and ever they'll get over it if they like treated you weird about it and like acted grumpy about it it's probably just because they're tired and they don't know you and that's probably what it is so don't take it personally but if you really want to roll with someone i would encourage you to ask them and if they say no that's fine people can say no also remember just with all that stuff as far as um rolling with people that are dangerous or crazy just remember the the flip side of it if you are, let's say you're, you're, a, you're a girl or you're a smaller person and someone approaches you that you have seen that's very overly aggressive when they train or maybe they just spaz out and you've had an experience rolling with them and it just doesn't feel safe for you, you do not have to roll with them. You can always say no. I always explain to the smaller people in my class, these, you are, these people are not entitled to rolls with you, especially if they're crazy. If they're moving real spastically and they you feel you're in danger, there is no shame in saying no to rolling with them. You don't have to roll with these people. Don't feel that you're a coward if you don't roll with them. You have to worry about your health when you're in class. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to like, consent to a role where you have zero control. You know, If they're able to control you so severely because of a size difference and they're like trying to beat you, just say no. You should never roll with that. I, I always get uncomfortable when I see white belts rolling with other white belts, especially like white, white belt smaller kids or teenagers or women who it's just like, I'm not quite sure that it's like a perfectly controlled situation. And so a little bit of the, that responsibility falls on the instructor to kind of like manage and make sure no one, no partners are matched up that are too much of a discrepancy. But it is on you also to say no, and you don't have to say yes. Just like Andre said, you're totally entitled to be like, no, I'm good this round, I'm gonna rest this round. And that, that's totally fine, no one's gonna get upset with you. Don't feel pressured ever to do a role that you don't really want to. And there's a difference between a role like that and just a hard round. I'm not telling you, or we're not telling you to avoid hard rounds. Sometimes a hard round is what you need. It's those rounds where you feel that your safety might be compromised. Exactly. Yeah. If, if you feel like if I roll with this guy, I might get, even if you just feel like you're get kind of bruised up, like don't do it. It's not worth it. You can have a, a good round instead. So I think that covers most of the things you should avoid doing and some of the things you should do in certain situations. And so yeah, that closes up the dick moves to avoid.